Um, man, this is uh, about as nerve-wracking as that first snap at the beginning of a game, except I can't hit anybody to get the nerves out. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it is a huge honor to be here. I, when Jewel asked me to speak, I thought it was just a regular big FCA, kind of like COVID, where there would be 25 people. There's definitely more than 25 people here. Um, but I'm super honored, super blessed to be in the same stage podium that Jody has spoken at, Joshua G, Brett Plyler, Hannah Stobbs, all these incredible people, uh, and I'm just really humbled to be here. Uh, it's, a, it's kind of a weird feeling. I really never thought that I would speak in chapel, but uh, I'm excited. I am ready. I'm nervous a little bit, so you're going to have to bear with me. Uh, but first, I would like to thank a couple of people. Um, first and foremost, there's a man who has touched so many lives. Uh, he's an incredible guy. He is uh, super flexible in order to squat down low, uh, in order to catch baseball catches. He is an absolute unit. Jake Girardi! Yeah! Oh, man, I love the baseball team. Okay, real talk. Um, I am super thankful for just my mom and my dad. I know that's kind of cliche. Um, today I'm going to be talking about kind of delighting in the Word, delighting in, in the Bible and Scripture um, and both my parents have exemplified that really well. Uh, my dad, if you don't know, he has a doctorate in theology, so he's he studied the Bible for years, um, and he just really impacted me and my brothers by talking about theology a lot, and we would, like, on the way to practice, we would just chat about different concepts and things in the Bible, um, and he has just had a really big impact in how I understand and process through the Word of God, uh, and my mom exemplified kind of a a different aspect really well. My dad delights in scripture, but my mom really, really just loved to spend time with the Lord uh, and be in the word. We would get up at about six o'clock in order to make it to the bus at seven, in order to go through all the assembled traffic, uh, to get to classes, to get to school. And my mom would get up at five in the morning every day just so that way she could spend time reading the word of God. Uh, and it was just a good example to us as kids. Uh, I'm really great, grateful for her and all the things that she has done in my life. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, David King, I don't know him, you don't know him, but he wrote a really good book called Your Old Testament Sermon Needs to Get Saved, and that really helped me prepare for today, so I, I have to be grateful for that, and I'm really grateful for Jesse Hack as well, he helped me a lot preparing through it, he's a phenomenal guy, um, and uh, I'm just, I'm really thankful for the football team, man, I love all of you guys so much, big fan. <laughs> I love y'all a lot. Uh, everybody that's been involved in Bible study has been a huge blessing to me. Um, <laughs> I've just been so thankful for them. I'm thankful for everybody else. I'm thankful for my coaches uh, and the way that they love us, the way that they want us to be the best that we can be. Uh, and I hope that this word blesses them back in return and gives them a, a way that they can even be uh, the best that they can be. So the last, I guess person that I would like to thank is really the Holy Spirit. Like, I'm not going to lie, last week Saturday, I was in my room trying to read Psalm 1, and I didn't understand a lick. I was like, I'm just, what am I going to read? What am I going to, I'm just going to read Psalm 1 and get down, because I don't know anything. And I, like, I'm serious. It was so frustrating. And I prayed. I was like, God, I, I'm really at, a, like, my wit's end. I don't know what to do. Uh, and so I just threw continuous prayer in the Holy Spirit. Um, the next day, kind of looking back at the text, it really helped me prepare. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to spend some time in prayer real quick because the same thing is true for you guys. It's impossible for us to really understand this text fully without the Holy Spirit. So let's just bow our heads in prayer. God, I am so thankful to be here. Uh, it's honestly kind of a whirlwind. Um, I pray that you would just calm my nerves, Lord, that you would be here, that you would be with me um, and everybody here, that, Lord, they would understand the word. Lord, that I would preach it well, that I would be faithful to the text, that I would be faithful to what you have to say. Um, that I would honor you both on the stage and off the stage, Lord. And I pray that people leaving here would really apply this to their lives, um, that we would, we would honor you through understanding of Scripture, through relying on the gospel. Um, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so today we're going to be reading Psalm 1, the entire chapter, but I promise it's pretty short. It's only six verses. Uh, if you want to turn there real quick, I'll give you all some time. i got to turn there too, I'm not going to lie. Everybody there, raise your hand if you're there. Not a lot of people. Sweet. That means I'll give you all some more time.
Cool. All right. Um, so, starting off Psalm 1, 1 through 6. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Um, really good text. The reason why I chose it, actually, they were like, you can talk about anything you want to. It's like, ah, that's really nerve-wracking. I don't know what to say. And so they were like, just talk about whatever you're working through. Um, my family and I have been, we've kind of been scattered all over. My parents live overseas. My brother's in Georgia, the state, doing Impact 360. Um, and so we've been memorizing this text together, and it's, it's really been cool to see the Lord work through my life, the life of my family. And uh, even as I was prepping, the more I learn about this text, the more I'm encouraged by it. But we see here at the very beginning, we see two people, um, the blessed man and the wicked man. So kind of sticking in in uh, step with Brett's sermon right over here. It's the, the blessed man, kind of the narrow path that he was talking about at chapel, if you all remember that. And then over here, we're going to have the wicked man, just for, just for reference. So I, I point to the left, that's good, right is bad. Um, for you guys, I guess that's switched. But we see, uh, first and foremost, that the blessed man doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, and doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. But really, to understand that, we have to know who the wicked are. So y'all can stay in Psalm 1 if you want, but I'm going to turn real quick over to Psalm 53.3 and uh, a passage in Romans, so it, it'd probably be easier to stay in Psalm 1. But it says, uh, Psalm 53.3 says, they have all fallen away. Together they have been corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one, period. Not one single person. Later, Romans uh, Paul talks about this. He actually cites this text, and he says, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks God. Every single person who has been born, if you're a human being who's born, you begin out here. You're wicked, and you're walking in your own counsel. You're standing in the way of sinners. You're sitting in the seat of scoffers. Um, but thankfully, <laughs> this is really crazy, but there is actually a person who was born, blessed, right, uh, who never did that, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so just a real quick distinction, the blessed man, first and foremost, is a believer in Christ, and the wicked man is an unbeliever in Christ. That is, that's what we have to believe. Now, uh, looking into this text, we want to follow it. We want to understand it, right? So being blessed, clearly there's more criteria here than just being a Christian. Otherwise, it would say blessed is the man who's a Christian. It says blessed is a man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers. So we all want to be blessed. I want to be blessed. Uh, I don't know about you guys. I'm sure each and every one of you does. Uh, and the way to do that is by not walking in this counsel, is by avoiding counsel of the wicked. So that can mean a lot of different things. Uh, it can mean listening to people who just tell you really wicked things to engage in or encourage you towards sinful activities. But it can also mean uh, counsel of wicked people who put out their counsel on social media or in music. Um, I was really convicted when that hit me, when I realized that it is not just people in your life. Uh, because you're not really going to reach, like, have that many people like that at NGU. Let's be honest, this is a really good place to be. Um, but does the music you listen to counsel you towards wickedness? Do the shows you watch scoff at the notion of biblical purity? Like, that, those are the real questions that hit me hard. And I was like, wow. Uh, I, if I'm going to preach this, I have to follow it. And so I went through my Spotify playlist, just all my like songs. It was like 1,400, big music guy. And immediately right off the bat, I got rid of 254 songs that I would classify as Counsel of the Wicked, which is about 17% of my playlist. That's about eight hours of music, and it entails about one out of 10 songs. So if I listen to 10 songs in a day on shuffle, it means one of those songs is counseling me towards wickedness. And Honestly, it's just, it's better for me. Like, it's not, it's not a begrudging thing to get rid of those songs. And there were some times where I was like, this song's a banger. Like, I don't, I don't really want to delete this song on my playlist because it's fire. It's free. Like, sometimes Christian music just isn't it. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, bro. You can't top the Migos' flow. It's better. But it's counseling you towards wickedness, and your life will be better. Like, 
It will be. It says, blessed is the man. This is, it is better for you to follow this. Um, it is better for you to follow this. So at the same time, we, we can't live in a Christian bubble. Like we can't stay away from the wicked. We should absolutely stay away from the counsel of the wicked. It says so in the text. But we shouldn't avoid engaging with wicked people because that's what, that's what Christ did. That's how Christ loved others. That's how he loved us. If Christ never engaged with wicked people, we would not have a relationship with him because we were wicked people. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance here. Now, you absolutely avoid the counsel, but you do engage with the wicked. And before I turn over to uh, verses 2 and 3, I want to say real quick that for those of you who are kind of sitting back and thinking, you know, this is, this is a little extra, getting rid of my music, like it's not that big of a deal, uh, I want to paint the picture for you that this is a progression. You see here that it is the, uh, he's, first he walks in the counsel of the wicked, then he begins to stand in the way of sinners. Then he takes a seat down in the seat of scoffers. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever had like a casual conversation, you're usually walking, it's not a big deal. And then something heavy hits or someone says something, you guys stop. You start to talk about it. And something really serious, you'll sit down. And so it becomes this, this kind of trajectory towards wickedness and towards scoffing at the word of God. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't think it's that serious, uh, verses 6 and verses four through six, I think, kind of sum up why it is serious. Uh, the words there are not lightly to be taken. Verse six says, the, the way of the wicked will perish. Like, it is serious. It, it, it means perish. It, it's not a light little thing where we just read it and think, oh, okay, like the wicked will perish. Those are really terrible people, horrible, awful people. Those are the people who listen to the counsel of the wicked. Those are the people who sit in the seat of scoffers who stand in the way of sinners. Um, so that is what we should avoid if we want to have a blessed life. But we wouldn't spend our whole entire lives avoiding things because what are we going to fill our time with? We're just going to be terrified of counsel the wicked, counsel the wicked. Okay, but I got to engage with the wicked. What do I do? Uh, just to I kind of kind of get this picture. When I was in middle school, I was a huge country music fan. Like massively into country music, Jason Aldean, Tim McGraw, everybody like that, Luke Bryan, I loved them all. And I know that's kind of weird, but there was this guy who lived in the overseas who was like two years older than me, Tim, name was Thomas Varner, my best friend, and he was so Southern. I mean, I'm talking about this guy spent 12 years overseas, six years in Mississippi, and was probably more Southern than Kale Swift, which that's really Southern. Um, no, but there's a song there, and it's called uh, Not Every Man Lives. And in the, in the song, he says, every man dies, but not every man lives. And if I walked off stage and gave you that picture, that's all it would be telling you. It would just be telling you how to avoid dying. It wouldn't be telling you how to live your life. It wouldn't be telling you what to be grounded. I think verses 2 and 3 do a really good job of painting a picture of, okay, now we've got the negative out of the way, what we should avoid. What do we fill our lives with? Verses 2 and 3 in Psalm 1 say, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. So now we see characteristics of this blessed man. Right now we're kind of focusing on him. He doesn't engage in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. He is delighting in the word of God. And that's what's giving him life. He's a tree that's alive. Um, so to live life to the fullest, we must not only avoid the counsel of the wicked, but also plant ourselves firmly in the soil of God's word by the river of scripture, and it, we will produce fruit. Now, how do we do that? It says it in verse 2. It says delight, his delight in the law of the Lord. He delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, if you already delight in the law of the Lord, I really hope that you leave this chapel a big FCA time, and you're excited about this, this like new opportunity for you to engage with the, with the word of God. It's not simply reading it. He's not delighting in the word, and then he just reads it. He meditates in it, right? He meditates in it. Um, and so a picture of that is, uh, I think, really well exemplified by this guy who wrote a book called Spiritual Disciplines. I think his name is Don Whitman. Um, I'm pretty sure. And uh, he, like, he gives this example. He says, we are like a bowl of hot, a teacup of hot water. And scripture is a tea bag. And every time we listen to a sermon in chapel, it's one drop in there. And every time we listen to a sermon, it's one drop in there. Every time we read the word, it's one drop in there. 
Every time we memorize scripture, it's a couple of dips in there. And, and we do get richness and fullness from that. But meditation is like soaking that tea bag in the water and letting it pull out all the richness that comes from that tea bag. So I hope if you're already delighting in the word that you're excited about that. But if you're not, I want you to know that meditation will draw out delight in God's word. There's an opportunity for you to delight in God's word because I, like, I don't always delight in the word. Sometimes I really don't want to read it. And just forcing myself to read through it has not blessed me. But what has blessed me is actually when I was learning about this text, learning to meditate on scripture. I don't have time to go through all the different techniques that he has, all the different ways that he has for meditation. Um, he's got like 17 different things. I tried like one or two of them. But I'm sure a lot of the ministry staff would love to talk to you. There's ways to Google it. Um, but for those of you who don't delight in God's word, just know that there's hope. Like, Know that if you sit there and if you meditate on verses like Psalm 1-2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he will meditate day and night. It will begin to, to change the way you view scripture. Meditate on verses that have to deal with what you're going through for the purpose of application, right? The purpose of meditation is not so you gain a better head knowledge. It's so you actually apply it in your life and gain a better heart knowledge. One of the ways that I think we go wrong is we, we characterize spiritual maturity as how much you know about the Bible or how much theology you know. And I'll tell you right now, that's so wrong. Because that's how I characterize spiritual maturity. And I thought I was pretty spiritually mature. Until this summer, uh, I did this program called Great Commission Team. It's a really good program. I would highly recommend it for everybody. Uh, but we went to Phoenix for a week to learn what church planting was like. And I remember distinctly sitting there. And the guy up on stage, church pastor, planter, is a high school auditorium about the size of like one-fourth of chapel, maybe one-fifth. And he was sitting there, and he said, or he was standing there, I was sitting there, he said, spiritual maturity is not measured by how much theological knowledge you have, but by how much you live out the gospel in your day-to-day -day life. And I was like, oh my gosh, bro, I'm so spiritually immature. Like, <laughs> holy crap. Uh, and that's, that's where you're at if you just meditate for knowledge. That's where you'll go. You'll end up there. You'll have a whole lot of head knowledge, you won't apply it in your life, and you'll be really confused. And I don't want that for you. Like, it is, it is good for you to delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it to apply it in your life. Um, now that we understand kind of what this delight, what this meditation looks like, the fruit of it and what it really, the picture that we have in verse 3, uh, it's a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. I want to preface this real quick by talking about prosperity. Uh, this does not mean that if you meditate on the word of God, you will be earth, like prosperous in your earthly life. If you spend an hour a day meditating on scripture, I promise you, you're not going to hit Dre's 40 time. You're not. Or Kwame's squat record. Or you're not going to be as good of a catcher as Jake Girardi. It's, it's just, you have to be there. You have to catch. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it, but it does mean a, a spiritual prosperity. And it, it does mean a heavenly reward, a heavenly prosperity. And I'm telling you, I've, li I've lived this. Like, not by much. But the times that I do delight and meditate on the word of God, I have I've felt so much better. I've felt so much more in tune with the spirit. I have prospered because of this. Um, one, of the, one of the key things to understand here is that this would not be possible without Christ. Um, and I think it's really cool. There's actually a, a theme here throughout scripture of abiding in the word. But what's really cool is later on in John, we see at the beginning of John, it says, in the, word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, and this, this picture of delighting in the word, it's not just delighting in scripture, it's actually delighting in Christ as well. And another section that just backs that up is this idea of the tree. John 15, 4 through 5. You don't have to turn there. I got you. Um, John 15, 4 and 5. Jesus is talking here. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. We can't delight in the word. But also, the picture here is of a vine, but really it's of a plant, of a tree, of a a organism that we have to be connected to in order to live. So not only is this river, scripture, but this tree is also Christ. And, and we need to be abiding in Christ in order to gain prosperity from the word. Right? Um, and just, I mean, what's really cool is just think about, like, 
Think about this text. Think about Jesus as a kid sitting there reading this text and thinking, that's me. I'm, I'm the one who's supposed to delight in the word because none of these people can. All these people are counseling each other towards wickedness. All these people are, are sitting in the seat of sinners or sitting in the seat of scoffers, walking in the way of wicked. Uh, and just, I mean, imagine if he did it. Like Matthew 4 tells this really cool story where Jesus is out in the desert and he is tempted by the devil after 40 days. The devil says, look at all these, these amazing kingdoms. I could give them all to you. Just bow down and worship me. And Jesus is like, I'm sorry. No. But what he does is he quotes scripture back at him. Also, uh, in Matthew 4, he, uh, the devil says, because he's hungry, Jesus is hungry, he says, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus delighted in scripture more than food. That's how much we're to delight in the word of God. What is really crazy is I actually last week was kind of procrastinating on this. I was like, I don't really want to, I don't know what to even start with. I've never done a sermon before. And so I just kind of like surfed YouTube and found this video of John Piper talking about like 10 things that I would change if I went back to my 20s, or 10 things I would do if I went back to my 20s. Uh, And it's cool how through God's sovereignty, that actually can be woven into this. What he said was actually, it dealt with the word. And he said in this podcast, he said, I would resolve to read my Bible every day for the rest of my life. I would make it more important than eating or getting exercise or kissing my wife. I I don't know what that feels like. Uh, Eddie is engaged. He talks about it all the time, so he will know what that feels like pretty soon. But regardless, like that's the level we're supposed to delight in. As much as delight, as much as Eddie delights in being engaged, as much as John Piper delights in kissing his wife, they are to delight even more in scripture and we are to do the same. We're to delight in it more than getting exercise, more than being athletes. That's, that's the picture we're supposed to treasure it above everything else. But why do this? Like, why, like, I know we have this picture of, okay, kind of this blessedness, this prosperity, but why do this? Because there is someone who did this even better and perfectly for you. See, there was a guy, Jesus Christ, who came to this world who lived a perfect life. He was the only man who was perfectly blessed, perfectly did not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He perfectly delighted in the word of God. And he did that because he desires that you do it too and that you have the opportunity to do it because it's good. He lived a life. He died on a cross as God, as man, and rose three days later, conquering death for all. So we have the opportunity to live in that freedom. Now, if you're, not, uh, if you're not a believer, if you're here and you know you are, I, I just want to paint the picture of what that looks like first. Verses 4 through 6 in Matthew, or in Psalm 1, are not something that I really want to get up here and preach on. But they are in the word of God, and that's my job. It says, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Real quick, in order to understand this first, we have to know what is chaff. Uh, first time I ever read this, I was like 14 or 15 years old, and I had a couple of questions, but that was one of them. Chaff is this part of the wheat grain that the Israelites knew was not nutritious. It, was, it didn't taste good at all. And so they would bang the wheat on the on the earth on the uh, concrete, whatever, on the floor, and the wind would blow it away. It was worthless. It did not contribute to anything. Um, They would actually gather it up and burn it. Psalm 1 doesn't talk about that. Other places in Scripture do. Um, But further to understand verse 5, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. I was really confused because I thought that meant not standing in the judgment, like they won't be judged. They won't have to stand in front of it. What it really means is they will crumple and fall. They will crumple and fall. They will not stand in the judgment. They will be judged, and they will be found guilty. And if you are among that group, I'm telling you right now, that is going to happen. That's going to happen. If you believe any other section of the Bible is true, you have to believe this section of the Bible is true as well. That will happen to you, and I don't want it to. I want you to be blessed. I want you to prosper. I want you to delight in the word. It's better for you. It is good. Delighting in Jesus Christ I'm telling you right now, I have almost never regretted disobedience or never regretted obedience, (laughs) but I have always regretted disobedience. It has never brought me what I wanted. 
it has never fulfilled me. Okay? And if you are over here, if you have been saved, man, avoid the counsel of the wicked and delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it. One thing I want to leave you guys with is if you come back on Monday and you have not meditated or strived to meditate at least or reached out to someone or read the word of God or delighted in the word of God, you have been disobedient to God. This, 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 this sermon, this speech, I don't really know what to call it because chapel, it's not church. I don't know if it's a sermon, if it counts, but it's not just so you can sit here, listen, and be filled. It's so you can sit here, listen, be filled, and apply it to your life just as you would if you meditated on it, just as you will when you meditate on it. If you come back on Monday and you have not meditated on the word of God, you have been disobedient. And I'm not saying that as like, okay, I'm better because I've done this a couple times. I'm saying this as someone who's going to be even more disobedient. I will not only be disobedient, I will be a hypocrite. I'm standing up here and telling you all to meditate. If I don't do that, how much worse will it be for me? But also, how much better will it be for all of us if we do? Like, this is prosperity. This is blessedness. This is good. And uh, I just, I want to let you know, too, that if you do come in Monday and you think, oh, my gosh, I completely forgot. Oh, this is awful. Uh, I've been there, and there's grace for that. Jesus Christ died on the cross for all sins, including not meditating on Scripture, not delighting in the Word of God. To kind of summarize this, I know people usually start out with, like, a, a sermon illustration at the beginning. I kind of actually wanted to close with it just to hammer the points home. But... Think of the Bible as the playbook for life. Like, all of us are athletes in here. I'm, I'm pretty sure all of us have a playbook. I don't think golf does. Uh, Y'all might correct me on that one. Uh, but I'm sorry. I just, I don't know sports that well uh, other than football. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I think lacrosse is sick. Baseball is fun to watch. Softball is super cool. But I just, I really don't know much about them. Uh, but, <laughs> um, no, but think about this as the playbook for life. So, Every, every good athlete spends time in the playbook. And, and why do they spend time studying, learning, and memorizing every detail about it? Right? They memorize it to, to live it out, to do it. And in order to be better on the field, in order to have a better career, in order to have more fun. Like, if you don't know what you're doing at practice, practice kind of sucks. I'm not going to lie. Why, why do I know that? Because I've been to practice, and I didn't know what I was doing. And it sucked. <laughs> Seriously, though, like, the best athletes know the playbook well, and they, they live it out. And not only that, like, we should understand that, that being in Christ means we're on the winning team already. We don't have a head coach who, if we miss a tackle, is going to lose his mind. He's going to love us still just as if we had made the sack or if we'd gotten the interception or if we made the pass or whatever your illustration is. I'm sorry for the rest of the sports. I don't have great illustrations for that. Like I said, I don't really know all the other sports that well. Uh, but I love you guys so much. And I want you guys to understand too, like, this is better for you. And that team's already won. The score, the score is three to a couple thousand, and it's racking up. And that three is a field goal that the devil kicked, and he thought Jesus was in the grave for three days, and then he rose. Like, I'm telling you right now, like, get in the playbook of life. And if you, if you are on that losing team, you will lose. So hop, on, hop over, we're winning. I, I want you to be here. I want you to delight in the word. Let's pray. God, I'm so blessed to be part of this school. <laughs> I love everybody here. I love the ministry staff, Lord. I'm so thankful for everybody who uh, helped guide me along the way, Lord, for my parents, God, for a dad who, who understands the Bible so much and can help me out so many times. Every time that I've had a question, he has never failed to answer it on the spot. It's wild. Uh, how much knowledge you have given him, Lord, the way you've blessed him, God. I don't boast in him, but Christ through him, Lord. The same thing for my mom, Lord, a mom who loves me and loves you so much more and how better that is for me, Lord. I'm thankful for FCA. Lord, the way that they have developed me, grown me, poured into me, Lord, for Jewel Bell, Lord, for Eddie, God, for the small group, Lord, the way that you're moving on the football team. God, I am humbled to be here. And I honestly, it's been a blur, so I don't even remember half the things that I said. But God, I know that you were speaking. I know that you were talking, that you were moving, Lord, that you've prepared me well. And I pray that we would go out and we would live this. We would meditate on the word of God, Lord. I pray that I would meditate on the word of God, that I would delight in your word, that I would delight in the sun, that I would delight in the living word, Lord, that I would abide in the branches. 
God, I'm so thankful for the sports we have here. Lord, the way that NGU pours into us financially, but also just uh, spiritually, Lord, physically by uh, helping us train and get better as athletes, Lord, our desire to win. God, I pray that we would succeed. Lord, I pray for the football team on Saturday that we would win. Uh, Lord, that we would beat West Florida. Um, I pray for any of the other sports that have games out there, Lord, that they would dominate and that we would be a athletically excellent school. Um, and God, we just recognize that this all comes from you. This is impossible, Lord. A tree planted by streams of water, Lord. Without those streams of water, we're dead. We're like chaff. So, Lord, I'm so thankful for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.